watching this. Uh, another is a, a, girl, a girl in a Bangalore hostel was killed by the watchman. Then page 3 says uh, a, a boy's mother lodged a complaint against a 45 year old man living in her vicinity who kidnapped her son and put him in his room. Uh, also the last page talked about uh, Tanya Mirza and Martina Hendricks' participation in the Paribas Open. Great. So, uh, women have been in news in, uh, in one context as perpetrators of crime, the abandoning of the child. In another, as the abandoning means uh, she kills a child and abandons it, I think. The selective uh, abortion of a female child the other in the international context. And the other is about this uh, tennis, uh, I mean, uh, the badminton achievement of a girl, which is which reflects how the society is changing as well and at the same time how the media pick up on a story where uh, women's criminality is highlighted. I mean, I was watching uh, on the International Women's Day in one of the popular news channels a feature program on who are the most dreaded women criminals of the world. Uh, uh, giving it on, a, uh, on an International Women's Day was something that I thought is what Susan Faludi this famous media critic, she was a reporter of New York Times. He, she wrote a book called Backlash. How the media have gone on a backlash on liberation movement and how the prejudices are revealed, you know. I was watching this news feature as I told you. And Susan Faludi takes many examples. Like during the 60s when the first <coughs> feminist movement episode happened, the book Feminine Mystic, which was written by Betty Friedan, uh, and the book went viral because for the first time somebody was writing about the lonely life that the American housewives were leading because they were supposed to do be domesticated, looking after children and managing home. The man used to be the breadwinner. So this kind of uh, uh, context, she being a news reporter, she for her newspaper she was collecting interviews, this Betty Friedan. And then she realizes how the lives these women were leading was uh, of certain type of quality as far as personal pursuit of happiness was concerned. You know, pursuit of happiness is one of the important rights in the American Constitution. So she published these narratives in the form of a book called Feminine Mystic. And thereafter, a lot of women came out of their homes, started spending outside homes some time, uh, befriending other women, and an idea of liberation <laughs> came. Now, this was reported as uh, the, and women took a big march, and uh, that march was reported by the newspapers. But while reporting it, they said that women threw certain stuff to the uh, bins, and uh, who knows, some old uh, uh, outfits of women were there, uh, and um, um, lingeries were there. And it was told that uh, feminist movement is nothing but bra burning movement. So, reductionist and uh, a pervert way of reporting it according to Susan Faludi was the backlash of the media rather than reflecting the reality. It was not the angry rejection of women's own identity uh, or going and engaging in activities that men did by then. It was more of a projection by the media of the reality. So I want you to pursue this kind of uh, I, uh, theories and uh, <coughs> writings uh, even on the communication process in society, just like how we saw how stereotypes are recycled and form our worldview, however irrational they may be, because they were repeatedly circulated. So, if the media is not critical, or all of us who consume the media are not critical, there is a danger that we may be perpetuating these stereotypes and worldview. That is why. There are a lot of United Nations conferences which led to this kind of thinking of looking at gender as a human rights issue right from uh, uh, mid-70s till now. The 70s were declared as decade, international decade for women. Uh, so, mid-1974 1974 was declared as international year for women. So, from mid-70s onwards, by end of 70s, 1979, the CEDAW was signed. Uh, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women by the United Nations. Subsequent to the convention they saw, despite the convention being there, incidents of violence and deaths of women due to violence was escalating. Uh, domestically, public sphere, war situations, women's bodies became specific target of violence. So by 1994, there was this Beijing. Uh, conference. In between there were Vienna and other conferences by United States, but Beijing conference is the most important conference. So in the post-Beijing scenario, they adopted five different programs and one of the program was to monitor the media. 
So, as an offshoot of that, in 1995, in 2000, in 2005, every five years there is a media monitoring project. Uh, I had the privilege of becoming part of this project, GMMP it is called, Global Media Monitoring Project. And at that time when we, uh, on one single day, in the entire world, uh, the groups will engage in monitoring and evaluate. We had a coding sheet where we said about the age, the role, the expertise, the woman as the victim, woman as the subject of news, etc. And in terms of visual media, television, we had to see the age of the news reporter, approximate, the role of the news reporter, how many expert people came. So all this when we saw the positive construct of woman as the maker of the news or as the creator of the news in rare expertise such as political reporting or financial reporting was negligibly small. And this showed that how even after five years the picture remains very dismal. Today we may see some women leadership figures coming up, but then when the media reflect, the media reflect less on how they talk, less on what they say, more on their looks and how they appear. This kind of bias is there in a lot of things, even in our own discursive practices in the institutes and other places, that uh, appearances uh, take precedence over the substance of uh, women. Uh, not that we should not care for appearance, for feeling good, both men and women should care for their appearance. But what I mean to say is, for a man, like for example, we used to watch grey-haired news readers in Doordarshan and some of these news channels. Still, I feel Doordarshan <coughs> retains uh, women at that age group. But if you look at some of these newly proliferating commercial channels, it seems to be that 100% Indians are young and they are in the age group of 20s and 30s. That's an illusion. So that is an intolerance to diversity and the intolerance of Bollywood to brown skin, you know, predominant. I mean, once uh, this uh, George Wyatt, the Harvard professor who had visited us, he asked me, do you import these actresses from Italy? Because uh, such is the look of the actresses. So this is how, and all these talks, today's talk, yesterday's talk about skin, you know, by the politicians of the country, netas. So a lot of media is engaging in criticism. So this kind of uh, uh, prejudice about youth of women, appearance of women, uh, they don't talk about the vice versa. That is what yesterday one of the, I mean, uh, Kushbu or somebody pointed out in Times of India channels debate, Times Now channels debate. So this is, uh, I don't want to go lengthy on this, but I want you to know that Global Media Monitoring Project, year by year, uh, every five years, report after report pointed out how empowerment uh, possibilities as a reflection of reality through the media is happening very, very slowly, disappointingly slowly. So we also did a study under the Asian network on gender reflections on television and there also we saw stereotypes being reinforced through the media. Now we can draw two types of conclusions from this. One is that media seldom makes a critical attempt to highlight such exceptional stories where women are in the center or uh, somebody like an aged person is in the center, general stereotype. Second point we can say that controls over the media and uh, the purchase power in terms of buying the media products also might be playing a role. Suppose a media um, cast news which is or stories which are suddenly radical, they have a fear that their viewership or audience will go away from them. So a lot of other force, economic forces seem to be playing a role. Uh, the third point is more and more women entering the reporting scenario as the experts uh, might change the situation. For example, uh, Gina, uh, yeah, uh, Gina Garrison writes, a French reporter, that for the first time when the French woman reporter came, entered the newsroom, the first ever child abuse case was reported. It, uh, the, the, he, till then, it wouldn't have been, the child wouldn't have been opening up to a reporter because predominantly male reporters. The effective way of reporting was not very much known or they would have taken things for granted. It is the female reporter who for the first time brought the story of child abuse to the uh, room. Similarly, women reporters have made a lot of difference. I mean, you know the um, corruption cases like Harshad Mehta uh, scam was brought up by a female reporter, Sucheta Dalal. Chitra Subramanian's uh, report on Beaufort's scandal is very well known. 
So a lot of times uh, women have made a lot of difference because they think <coughs> if it is women, if it is somebody who is from a minority group always makes a difference because we have a famous uh, statement in pedagogy of the oppressed, a classic book uh, by Paulo Freire, this South American thinker. Those who are at the margins know the margin and the outside. But those who are in the center, they know only the uh, uh, world around that center. Means once you are in the dominant position, the worldview that you have is very limited. It, it is a dominant worldview, a familiar worldview, which does not reflect diversity. When you are on the periphery, you know what the dominant worldview is. Because you are not happy about it and you are criti in critical engagement with that, you also look outside for alternatives. Do you understand? So it's very important that we reflect that diversity, uh, including the important diversity that gender is. That's why I was telling you about equal opportunities uh, idea. In England, it's picking up very strongly. Legislations have been coming forth. In India, Equal Opportunities Commission was appointed in the last government. We hope that it will be taken forward. So in Equal Opportunities, it is not just gender. There are other uh, equally troublesome issues. And if somebody is of that gender, for example, racial minority and gender, it compounds the inequality. Um, if you are aged and you are a woman, it compounds your subordinate position. So, or a weak position. So, how gender compounds and gender is an isolated category of inequality as well. I hope it's uh, clear. Now, let's come to the last exercise in order to understand the stereotype. Uh, is it the one which has the arrow? The video? It's here. <coughs> this one, no? VTS. Yeah. How do we do that? Thank <laughs> you. 